Hi, I'm Sue Glenn. We've already talked about uh, Lotka Vater uh, predator prey models and uh, some of the experiments that have been done that demonstrate it. And most of those experiments uh, didn't work. And uh, so we're going to be talking about some more complex interactions regarding uh, predator prey and exploitative interactions. Uh, and we're going to start off with the concept of looking at a refuge. I'm using the textbook Ecology Concepts and Applications 8th Edition, which was written by Manuel Moles and Anna Scher and published by McGraw-Hill in 2019. So we're, we're going to deal with the last couple of sections of chapter 14 in this presentation. We talked about uh, predator-prey models and some of the experiments that were done, uh, such as Gauze's experiment with uh, paramecium and bacteria. Uh, a lot of the times these experiments didn't go well and we don't often hear about experiments that don't go well but uh, often that the uh, the predators would eat all the prey and then they're in a confined area they don't have anywhere to hide and then the prey once they're extinct the predators will starve to death and so you need uh, some place to hide you need refuges of various types to persist in this face of exploitation so the the prey or the host of the parasite or whatever it is uh, are going to need some sort of refuge. Uh, when Gauze, um, you know, was doing this, one of the things he experimented with was trying to get population cycles with paramecium caudatum and the things that preyed upon that. So this is a paramecium right here, and they get preyed upon by uh, didinium. Didinium is is smaller. Um, but what it has, it has little stingers, and so it'll shoot the paramecium with its little stingers, and then the paramecium will try to like shoot back, but it, it like it shoots off its cilia as well. You can see that happening, and that doesn't stop the didinium, and the didinium will actually then uh, latch on and eat the entire giant paramecium um, and and kill it that way. And when gauze uh, would put them together in a little dish, the didinium would eat all the paramecium, and then the didinium would go extinct because it ran out of food. And so the absence of a refuge for the prey led eventually to the extinction of both. So then what he put was sediment on the bottom. You put gravel in the bottom, and then you've got a place where the paramecium can escape. And uh, so the didinium would eat most of the paramecium, then the didinium would have nothing to, left to eat and uh, it would die and then the few paramecium would then uh, start to come back and their populations could grow again. And so to get the oscillations, what, what Gauss had to do was he had to take some more of these uh, didiniums and, and he had a separate culture of those and he would have to uh, put a few back in and so he would have immigration. And then when he got the immigration, then the the paramecium would drop again, and then the didinium would die out, and then he'd have to bring some back. So he had to have periodic migrations. Um, and people will say, well, that's not that's kind of fake doing that. But uh, we already know that species move around. Individuals and populations move around. Um, that, that are there places where they have large clump distributions and other places where they're less common. And that dispersal is really important for maintaining population uh, populations in some areas. We talked about uh, populations moving from um, one patch to another patch and sources and sinks. So this is probably something that uh, consistently does help uh, and is something that you uh, see that uh, uh, you could have the, we saw predators moving in when prey populations were larger. And so maybe that does make some sense. So here's really what, what we found. Um, so we can see on the top graph, we have time on the x-axis and we have the numbers of predators and prey where the predators are in red and the prey are in black. And when the prey populations get high, the predator populations uh, will grow and they eat so many prey that the prey go extinct and then the predator goes extinct. Adding in a refuge, then you can um, get eaten by the predator, but a few of you will hide 
The predator can't find any food. The predator population declines and the prey population can recover, but the predators go extinct. By having immigration from outside populations, so here the prey is doing really well. The predators start eating it. The prey population crashes. A few of them hide and the predator can't find them. So the predator population will crash. Um, and then the prey population starts to grow. And then a few predators come in, rebuild the predator population. And so you can get those isolations if you have this immigration from a source population. So you have to have that immigration coming in from another population in order to keep this process going. And in general, you do find predators have very large home ranges as they go from place to place in order to find a food. They are constantly moving from one spot to another. So uh, with the, the Gauze's uh, realization about the importance of, of refuges, uh, Huffaker in the 50s uh, tried to come up with a system where he was using mites and uh, he had these six spotted mites which were the prey and then he had these predatory mites that would attack them and um, the six spotted mite would eat oranges and uh, so he had these places where he had oranges and rubber balls and uh, the oranges uh, the the uh, mites would crawl around but the uh, to keep a refuge, what he could do was put Vaseline on a rubber ball to keep the predatory mite from crawling onto it or onto the orange. Um, but the um, the uh, the mite that was the six spotted mite that was getting eaten, it could actually make little threads, little balloons and float around so it didn't have to crawl everywhere. And so what he would do is he'd get little posts that would be launching pads and he could have the, those uh, prey ones could climb up there and float onto a rubber ball or a uh, an orange where uh, they could actually uh, be hidden from the guys that were trying to eat them that were crawling around. Uh, he had a lot of different setups that didn't work, but finally he did this setup where he had 120 oranges and he got the oscillations to occur for six months. So he had this complex array of uh, oranges and then they have a petroleum jelly um, on some of them so that they, the predatory mites couldn't get all of them. And, uh, and we could see then this led to over a six month period, we got these two full cycles of oscillations um, uh, in that time period. So he was able to, to sort of uh, allow enough hiding spots for the prey that they could survive when their populations crashed as they waited for the pre predator population to decline so low that the prey could increase their their population size. So um, so the Lock of Altera model sort of stimulated this uh, work on predator prey and actually uh, showed that the the refuge idea was important and uh, and then there's a, a number of different ways then um, organisms can find refuge from predators I found this really cool I was looking up um, some more about trying to understand this, this, these bites and these oranges and stuff. And I found a really cool diagram here from uh, the paper where he's showing that uh, a picture of where you're finding the, the six spotted mites, the prey, those are the orange colors. And the uh, density of the color is uh, how many little prey mites you have. So right here we have the six spotted mites, lots and lots of them. And uh, and whereas over here there's not very, or right here we have not very many six spotted mites. And then the black dots are where the predators are. So we have um, lots of both of them here. And then here we have lots of predators compared to how many prey. And then here we've got like one predator sitting there. 
and then these guys will start to rebound. So I thought that was pretty cool to actually see where they are on the oranges in their their little mite universe. We generally think of a refuge as a hiding spot, but there's different ways of taking refuge and different ways you can hide. And one is you can um, hide in, in a burrow or um, up in, in a different part of your habitat uh, or hiding in the water. Uh, so there's, or if you're in the water, you could climb up onto the land. There's a lot of different spatial places you can hide, but you can also hide in a crowd uh, and you can have protection in numbers. And so uh, living in a large group provides a refuge. And uh, we've already talked, remember we talked about um, Holling's uh, response curves for um, numerical responses to uh, dealing with uh, predator prey. Uh, we had looked at those type 1, type 2, and type 3 responses where um, basically no matter what type of response, this is the number of prey eaten uh, versus the number of predators. So the number of predators versus the number of hosts, oh, sorry, I think number of prey eating This is the number of prey, and this is the number eaten. And so we found at some point you would sort of um, hit a maximum number you could eat, and you can't really eat more than that. And so uh, we know that the, the number of prey consumed by each predator, and then we multiply it by the number of predators in the area, you get the number of prey consumed by the area. Well, if you have so many prey that you sort of limit this number consumed by predators, um, you're going to satiate the predators and they're just not going to be able to eat anymore. And uh, and so you're going to find, you sit, make a threshold. And so um, prey can reduce their individual probability of being eaten um, if you're occurring in very high densities. So this is called uh, predator satiation. And we can see that uh, uh, when we combine the functional responses for the different predators, that if you have very few prey, if you have low densities of prey, um, you're going to, as you increase prey, you're going to, going to get uh, from predator one, they're eating you and then getting satiated predator two, predator three, your your amount of prey being consumed will peak and then it'll actually go down. This is the percentage, not the number. So the percentage of prey, as your population gets bigger and bigger, your probability of not getting eaten goes up. So um, sometimes being in a crowd is better than hiding. Um, it's a good way a good way to avoid getting eaten um, and especially uh, you could do really well in a herd or a crowd if you blend in uh, that way if you sort of stand out the predator can kind of keep an eye on you and chase you till you are tired but uh, if you look like everybody else it loses track of you and, uh, and then you get a chance to to uh, slow down a little bit as long as you stay in your herd So one animal that you may be uh, familiar with that does this uh, predator satiation is uh, cicadas. Cicadas come out and the, they emerge in the summertime. Uh, so they spend most of their life underground. And uh, when they are coming out, they're, they're ones that come out like every 13 years or every seven years. They come out en masse. So they all come out at the same time for that particular group. And... Uh, and so there might be a 13 year or 17 year cicada or emergence. And then you have so many of them um, that uh, they can't all get eaten at once. So densities can, can be up to 4 million individuals a hectare. Remember, a hectare is 100 by 100 meters. Not that large of an area to have 4 million cicadas. Um, uh, Williams' study, he looked at a 16 hectare site and found uh, a million cicadas, over a million, and half of them emerged during four consecutive nights. So in four days, you get a million cicadas. There's absolutely not going to be enough predators to eat all of those. And really, only 15% of them were eaten by birds. 
the way they did this, they had little traps to see who was emerging, and then they had little uh, traps to catch them after they they died, and they could look at them to see um, how they how they'd been killed. Had they just died naturally, because uh, they will, or will they be eaten by birds? And when they're eaten by birds, uh, they pull their wings off to eat the nice fleshy bit, and so uh, they can see the the uh, wings in the trap will give them an indication of how many cicadas were eaten by birds. So as we look over the course of the summertime, we see as the cicadas first come out, um, uh, this is uh, showing you the percentage mortality. So the red line are the number of cicadas, uh, which is the, the left axis. And then the purple line is the percentage of those that die. So as you have a few of them first coming out, a large percentage of those are getting eaten. The birds come in and eat them. And as you get more and more cicada, the birds can't eat anymore. It's not like the birds are eating less or eating the same number, but uh, that's a lower percentage of the population. And then as the cicada density uh, declines, then you can see the percentage eaten um, goes up again. But uh, you have a really good chance if you're in this uh, big group where at the peak, very few of you are going to get eaten by the birds. Um, size can be a refuge. If you're little, you're obviously going to be more vulnerable. If I'm really big, then uh, I'm too scary to, to try to eat. Uh, so if large individuals are ignored by predators, then large size can be a form of a refuge. Um, little tiny mayflies. Uh, make themselves look big when a stonefly is coming to try to eat them. And uh, so in terms of optimal foraging uh, for the stonefly, say, oh, that looks too, like, I'm going to expend too much energy trying to eat that giant thing. Um, I want to go find something smaller. And so uh, it, it, it seems like it would be lower profitability to try to get something that's going to take my energy to try to eat. This little sad stonefly or mayfly only lives less than a day. They, don't, they emerge from the water and mate, and then they can um, lay their eggs in the course of one day up in the air flying. So here we can see they're just these little tiny guys on, on the fingernail here, these little uh, mayflies. But then what they'll do is, is uh, here's the stonefly coming, I'm going to eat you. And the mayfly said, no, you're not. I'm a scorpion. And they makes a scorpion uh, posture. And the stonefly says, oh, never mind. And goes away and leaves them alone. So we know African elephants don't have any natural predators um, when they become an adult because there's nothing big enough to take them down. Um, though I had, I know uh, baby elephants get taken by, by lions, but adults uh, rarely do. Um, uh, there are some prides of lions, isolated ones that, that have figured out ways of getting an adult elephant, but you can imagine it expends a huge amount of energy and you'd have to be pretty desperate to decide you're going to eat one of those. Some of the behavior of organisms uh, are responding to the fear of being attacked. Uh, we can understand that. That seem, seems to be logical. Uh, so the presence of predators can alter the behavior to avoid that location. And this is known as the ecology of fear. And uh, predators can influence the behavior of the prey, which is going to make the prey go somewhere else, which could influence um, the habitat in those other places. An uh, example they put in your textbook is looking at the uh, return of the wolf to Yellowstone National Park. So wolves were hunted out of Yellowstone National Park on purpose. We were afraid of wolves, so we killed them. And they were completely wiped out. In fact, they were wiped out from the lower 48 states. Um, then there was pressure to bring them back because the elk population got huge. The wolf is a specialized predator for elk. The elk population was out of control. They were eating all the vegetation. There were, there were ripple effects through the ecosystem. So they took some wolf packs from Canada and brought them back to Yellowstone. Um, by the way, it is still controversial. Um, wolves have been returning to the U.S. naturally, crossing the Canadian border and uh, they were protected by the Endangered Species Act, but uh, there's been a lot of controversy over that as the wolf populations have grown. 
Anyway, when the wolves were returned to Yellowstone, um, the elk were uh, being hunted now by their natural predator. And the elk found that then when they were around the, the rivers uh, where the, the, the uh, shrubs and the small trees were growing, there was more places for wolves to hide and attack them. And it was harder for the elk to get away because it wasn't very open. Uh, so the elk decided to avoid those places. And, and uh, when they started to avoid eating the vegetation in those places, all that vegetation along the sides of the rivers and the streams came back. And it had not been there. Uh, well, the elk populations were huge, but we can see, so we've got the predator returning to, to Yellowstone, which is the wolf. We've got these elk now that are going to stay out in these open areas. They used to, this is next to a river, they used to eat everything in sight. Now they stay away from the rivers and look at it, it's all grown back. I put a, a YouTube video on our uh, playlist uh, about this particular uh, phenomenon at Yellowstone National Park and it really has to do with the um, the ecology of the fear being afraid of your predator there's at least 10 million species on the planet and when we look at how many interactions there must be between all these species we realize that this has got to be a lot more complex than what we've been talking about we're, we're just looking at two species at a time um, a paper in 1994 looking at uh, a lake in florida found that there were about 500 species in that lake but when we looked at the food web for that lake there were uh, about 25,000 uh, interactions uh, so it's incredible when we start to look at the number of interactions that things must get rather complex. This is looking at a food web uh, diagram uh, of dinosaurs uh, prior to the mass extinction event uh, from the asteroid, trying to figure out was it a, a stable or unstable amount of interactions. Understanding these interactions help us how understand how to understand how uh, ecosystem functions and whether they are resilient or unstable. Um, so uh, there's there's a lot we can still learn and there's a lot of complex examples of some of these interactions. So the very last part of this chapter talks about some of these in, uh, examples of some of these complex interactions. This is an example looking at a parasite called the spiny headed worm. Its scientific name is Plag Plagiorhynchus. This, this name right here, the rhinoceros horned spiny headed worm thing that uh, attacks the uh, intestines of these starlings. Uh, so this, this, the birds will, when they're eating, um, they, they're eating little bugs, they're eating little uh, isopods like, um, like little pill bugs. You see them around. Um, scientific name of the pill bug is uh, armad Delidium. It looks like a little armored armadillo, uh, vulgara. So vulgara is the scientific term for common. So it's the common pill bug, armadillidium vulgara. And the, the European starlings uh, scientific name is Sternus vulgaris. So vulgari, vulgaris, the common starling. That's the European starling. Um, and so what happens is that pill bugs like to hide in shady areas and uh, if they uh, eat the uh, the feces they're, they're detritivore, to to they're eating debris and dead organic material if they eat the feces of an infected starling then they get infected with this um, a spiny headed worm and that affects their behavior so that instead of staying in the dark areas, they wander off into light areas. They lose that um, uh, the negative phototaxis with the behavior where they avoid light and they become positive phototaxis. So the behavior that puts them right out here, right in the path of things that will eat them. And then the uh, stallions will eat them and they get affected by this uh, spiny headed worm which uh, completes its lifestyle in the intestines of the starling and then the starling will poo out its its uh, 
the eggs of the spiny headed worm and you continue the cycle. So you've changed the behavior of this little uh, pill bug by having it infected by the, by the worm. The researcher Janice Moore, uh, she had noticed that um, even if you had relatively few pill bugs infected, um, you'd still get a lot more of the infections getting into the birds. Uh, so you can see here that the uh, predation rate of infected pill bugs was much higher than the uninfected pill bugs because of that change in the behavior. Now they're more conspicuous, so they see more of the infected ones. So uh, she brought them into the lab and she actually decided to do an experiment where she had um, an uninfected cold control group and an infected experimental group. And so uh, what she'd done with the pill bugs was feed them uh, pieces of carrot that had the, the eggs of the spiny headed worm on them, whereas the control one didn't have um, any. And then so in three months, she had an infected population of pill bugs and she had a controlled population of pill bugs. And so she noticed that it didn't make them look any different. So you couldn't tell they were infected or not. Um, it was only that uh, their behavior was different, not their appearance was different. And then she could do experiments where she could um, uh, put them off in different environments with the birds and see what ones the birds were eating. Another example of a parasite that is altering behavior is a fungus that alters the behavior of a plant. And we don't really think about plants having behavior, but they do. They are growing flowers, they're growing leaves, they're growing roots, they're uh, sometimes making choices on, on uh, what they're going to be growing. And uh, this is looking at uh, a fungus, a rust fungus that grows on mustard plants that uh, this was looked at in the Rocky Mountains. And uh, the, rest of the, the fungus causes the, um, the bottom leaves of the plant to start growing up a tall shoot as if it was going to grow a flower uh, shoot. And normally they would, they would grow up this long flower shoot, shoot after spending several years just as a low growing form. But here it's making it uh, produce a shoot that is different. It's not the same um, as a flower shoot. It's a pretend flower shoot. And then uh, the fungal structures will form this cluster of bright yellow leaves at the top that look like bright yellow flowers, but they're fake. They're pseudo flowers. And basically the, these are the uh, sex cells being produced by the fungus. Uh, flies are, are attracted to this and um, and so the flies will uh, come as if they're pollinating flower to flower but uh, really what they are doing is um, they're, they're just taking the, the fungus from plant to plant and infecting more plants. Just a, a couple of pictures here. This is the normal flower stalk of the, the mustard plant. And this is the flower stalk of the infected mustard plant, which looks much more beautiful, um, but that is also um, affecting the pollinators as well. And they're not getting what they need. They're being, they're being duped. And uh, so the pollinators are not actually uh, carrying pollen from flower to flower at that point. So we've got some interesting behavior changes in, in plants, not just animals. So just a quick review. This chapter was pretty complex. We talked about different types of uh, interactions between species that are exploiting each other. We talked about how you can maybe uh, test that with doing some experiments with removing one species, seeing um, how another species uh, reacts to that. We talked about Lotka Volterra uh, predator-prey models and the really cool uh, elliptical dynamics between the species where they have these oscillating ups and downs. Then we talked about some of the complexity of this. We talked about, uh, you know, refugee, uh, refuges from uh, hiding from predators in, in different spaces, but you could also uh, escape a predator by getting in the middle of your herd or your flock, or you could uh, scare them away with your size 
or you get scared away by them and you have these cascades of impacts in the ecosystem. And then we talked about some of these really interesting examples of just the complexity of the types of interactions that we find between species. Oh, I almost forgot your homework. Um, do, do the concept review questions listed at the ends of each of the, the sections. I didn't go over section 14.4. And then do the re, have the review questions at the end of the chapter, which is uh, questions 5 to 10. And take a look at investigating the evidence number 7 um, about scatter plots. We've been using a lot of scatter plots in our labs, uh, so make sure that you understand that one. And uh, as I say, our next chapter is going to be dealing with island biogeography. So here's a famous island. Where would you find that island? Um, and uh, hopefully we see you when we talk about uh, chapter 22, which is called geographic ecology. So we'll see you there.